One of the first things that people always ask me is what brings me to India. And with fewer than 15% female researchers in this country and less than 1% foreign scientists, that's maybe not such an odd question. But I tell them this. My first trip to India, I had the privilege to travel to the Western Ghats, which is one of our world's most beautiful biodiversity hotspots. And there I went light trapping. What that means is you hang a large white sheet and you shine a light on it at night, and you see what kind of night creatures that you attract. And I was sitting there about 11 o'clock at night, and I watched as hundreds of species of moths and flies and beetles and crickets and tiny mammals came flocking to that sheet. I had never seen so many different types of animals in one place in my entire life, and I actually cried. And that biodiversity is why I'm here. Now, this is also India. India not only houses nearly 20% of our world's biodiversity hotspots, but it also has nearly 20% of our world's population. And that means that India's future is really our future as a planet. And we need to learn how to share our world with our natural inhabitants. We need to learn to live not just in the world, but with it. As my daughter Grace would tell you, one of the most important things in learning to share is learning to communicate. And in fact, communication may be one of the most important things in learning to live with others. But how, how do we communicate with nature? I mean, how do you talk to a tree? Or to a bird, for that matter? There is a single language which unites every single living being on this planet. Chemicals are fundamental units of life. And all life, from the smallest bacteria to the largest elephant, uses chemicals to communicate with each other and with their environment. Now, when you break all of life down, there's actually only three things that every living organism cares about, including us. You need to know what to eat, who's going to eat you, and you need to find somebody to love. That's it. That's true for us, it's true for algae, it's true for antelopes. It unites all of us together. And in fact, chemicals play a fundamental role in each one of these processes. To give you an example, the sweet smell of mountain strawberries is telling us that it's a nice source of nutrients and of energy. But you see, the strawberry is also telling you Come, come, eat me, eat me, take my seeds and spread them so that I can reproduce and grow more strawberry plants. That's its purpose as a fruit. But not all fruit maybe wants you to eat it. The queen of Indian spices, the chili pepper, produces a chemical called capsaicin, which is that famous heat you get whenever you bite into a chili pepper. And scientists believe that that actually may be a warning signal telling us mammals not to eat it. Because when we eat chili peppers, our digestive systems destroy the seeds, so they will not germinate. But when a bird eats a chili pepper, those seeds pass through its system just fine, and they'll germinate. And in fact, birds cannot taste the heat of the chili. So in this way, the chili pepper may be telling the birds, come, come to me, come eat me and spread my seeds, but telling us, stop and don't eat. Now, when it comes to love, what is a better symbol of love than the flower? And indeed, the sweet smell of a flower is often telling pollinators to come, drink the nectar, take the pollen, share it with other flowers so that the plant can reproduce. So how can understanding this language actually help us to learn to share our world together? To answer that question, I would like to take pollination as an example. Nearly 75% of our world's crops rely on pollination to some extent for their survival. But yet, nearly 40% of our insect pollinators are currently facing extinction from pesticide use, from environmental change, and from habitat loss. And this is a big problem because we need to learn how to maximize the efficiency of pollination, not only for the food security of ourselves, but also to preserve that remarkable biodiversity that we currently have in our world. Myself and my collaborator, Dr. Karen Nordstrom of the University of Uppsala in Adelaide, we set out to try to address this question. And our study species was this little pollinator right here called the hoverfly. 
Now, hoverflies are not the most efficient pollinators out there. That award goes to the famous honeybee, which I'm sure you're aware of. But they are some of the most prolific. Indeed, we found these little pollinators at vastly different climates and environments across the world. In tropical Bangalore, where I'm based, high up in the Himalayas, at nearly 4,000 meters. We found them in Central Europe, and we found them in the cold, temperate regions of northern Sweden. The same ho hoverfly. And that led us to ask, are all the flowers in all these different climates and environments speaking the same language to these hoverflies? Or do the flowers in these different environments also have a different language, just as we do in these different parts of the world? So to answer that question, we went to each of these places, and we sat and we watched which, hover, which flowers that the hoverflies were going to, and we collected the odors and the colors and the shapes and the sizes of all of these different flowers from each of these regions. And then we used those cues to create artificial flowers made of paper, and now they're being 3D printed, that we have put back into these environments the next year. And we've sat and watched to see if our little artificial flowers could attract these flies. And they did. <laughs> so we were able to create an artificial cue that was able to attract these hoverflies, which means that we're starting to understand this language. And by doing this, we are hoping to create artificial or natural lures that maybe can be used across climates and mitigate some of the effects of environmental change. And we're also using these cues to try to understand other effects, such as pollution, which is a project I'm working on in Bangalore right now. It's important not only to listen to our natural world, but also to listen to our own history. The Himalayan peoples of the northeast regions of India have a tremendous history of living with the natural world. For hundreds of years, they have learned this language of nature, and they have learned the ecology of the plants, animals, and microbes that surround them every day. In March of this year, I had the privilege to travel to the tiny village of Kadima Nagaland, which is home to about 3,000 members of the Angami Naga tribe. And I was there to understand their practice of entomophagy, which is eating insects. And I wanted to learn the ecology behind it. So while dining on a meal of fragrant caterpillars, I sat and I asked the villagers around me about the different plants and animals we were looking at. And I pointed to a bird. And I said, oh, do you, do you eat that bird? And they said, no, no, we, we don't eat that bird. And I said, oh, does it, does it taste bad? And they said, no, 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 it doesn't taste bad, but if we eat it, we won't have any rice. And I said, what do you mean you won't have any rice? And they said, well, you see, that bird feeds on a caterpillar that feeds on our rice. And if we eat that bird, we won't have a rice crop the next year. And I had such a, such a sudden, visceral realization that I wasn't the ecologist in the room at all. I was really just a student. And I had the privilege to learn the language of nature from a, one of our world's oldest ecological societies. So I hope that the next time that you bite into a ripe, juicy mango, or you smell the sweet fragrance of a vanilla blossom, that you stop and you listen to the story that they are telling you. Because I truly believe that only by listening to the language of nature will we be able to share this planet and preserve it for our future. Thank you so much.